good afternoon. The, uh, as you can see, the title there is Pittsburgh September 2011. Uh, this, the same presentation was given about three weeks ago um, at the International Molybdenum Association meeting. So uh, if you were there, um, my apologies, this could get boring. Um, if you weren't, um, I've been asked to speak about molybdenum uh, a few times over, over the last three or four years. Um, and every time I speak, there seems to be something happening in the next month, so, uh, so watch this space. Uh, the first time I did it was September 2008, and uh, within a month the price had tumbled from $35 a pound to about eight. Um, we're hoping for a, for a new decade that's uh, perhaps slightly less exciting than the last decade, but nevertheless uh, profitable for the industry. Um, I think we've still got a, an exciting decade ahead of us. Um, the, 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 the relative sexiness of molybdenum as a metal is, is debatable. Um, it's, it's certainly the case that the last five years have been um, both the peak and, and one of the biggest drops in the industry's history. Um, a sort of brief history is that the, the, the price was pretty much stable through the 80s and 90s um, and it was determined by a cost floor set by the byproduct producers who uh, mined primarily copper. Um, then as uh, Chinese stainless and alloy steel production ramped up very, very um, rapidly in the, uh, in the early 2000s at a rate of, uh, I think their stainless production accelerated at a rate of 52% annually um, between 1999 and 2007. Demand um, accelerated way quicker than, than supply could keep up with and the result was that the price went up to about 30 to $35 a pound where it stayed between 2005 and 2008. Um, following the credit crunch um, and a substantial uh, production cuts in, in both the Chinese and the Western stainless uh, sector, the price subsequently went down to about $9 a pound which was still considerably higher than the previous plateau. Um, and it rebounded back to about $14 a pound and what's happened between then and now has been that the price has pretty much yo-yoed between 14 and 17 and a half dollars a pound and I'll explain why that's why that's happening and how likely it is that the case will remain um, going forward um, some of the some of the um, words that we use to describe the molybdenum market are shown on this slide um, it's certainly a cyclical a cyclical metal in terms of demand there are intensity of use considerations and uh, again those uh, pressures on, on demand have gone both ways as a result of intensity of use and there is substitution both for molybdenum and, and, again, and, and against molybdenum uh, in the world, in the global industries. It's certainly a metal that has an, a very large number of end uses and, and as a result of that there, there is quite a bit of fluctuation between both intensity of use and, 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 and in terms of substitution for and against it. In terms of supply, the biggest factor going forward is obviously the impact of the, the copper industry boom um, and how that's affected byproduct supply from copper mines. Um, there is an issue of production discipline and that's been a major positive over the last two or three years um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And I'll also talk about the, the cost structure of the industry and how that's likely to change going forward. So um, firstly looking at demand, there's Demand is, is very fragmented in molybdenum, but there's certainly some first uses that um, dominate, and the strongest correlation is always between molybdenum demand and stainless steel supply. Now, stainless steel only accounts for about a quarter of moly demand, but the correlation is very strong between one but between stainless production and, and molybdenum demand, um, and it's certainly the case in the in the established stainless producers, including the U.S., um, Europe. And, and Japan. Um, the other thing that used to be mentioned um, alongside correlation was the oil and gas industry which, which the molybdenum uh, industry supplies with, with various tools which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, there certainly used to be a certain correlation between the molybdenum price and the price of oil. Um, that correlation has broken down a little bit in the last three years as both industries have witnessed quite a lot of volatility but that could return going forward and certainly the oil and gas sector is, is one of the major end users of molybdenum in the form of stainless or alloy steels most of the time. The other thing that is pretty obvious about certainly western demand for, uh, for molybdenum is, is that it's very seasonal uh, and this has been the case for, for several years. Um, 
usually the the, the summer months are, are very quiet and trader activity is at a minimum. Um, what makes this year a little bit worrying from the point of view of molybdenum demand is that summer's long been over, even though the weather in London uh, seems to suggest otherwise. But um, the summer's long been over and the, the trader activity is not really resumed at the pace that we were used to seeing it happen over the last few years. So um, how this chart's going to look in three, three or four years' time is, is certainly a matter for debate. Um, one, one thing that we can look at as, as an indicator is the nickel three-month price. Um, it's certainly the case that in stainless and alloy steels, a lot of the molybdenum is used in conjunction with nickel. And it's also the case that a lot of end users will, will base their decisions on, on what metal to use in their various applications based on um, the key um, raw material prices. And, and certainly chrome and nickel play a major part in this um, as they're both very volatile metals. Um, to the extent that the um, stainless users in um, non-pressure situations, in, in environments where critical performance um, is, is, not, is not an issue, um, have become pretty fed up with, with the general volatility of nickel prices. And not so much the level of the nickel price that's very high, but um, they're arguing that it's very, it's very difficult to hedge against this volatility. Um, and so they've been trying to substitute away from those grades, including nickel and molybdenum, and that's an issue going forward. China's patterns are a little bit more erratic. Um, there isn't really so, um, so much a seasonal um, stocking and restocking pattern as there is um, just general volatility. And this is because the, 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 the risk aversion level of, of Chinese traders is different. The risk aversion level of Chinese consumers is different and also the production patterns within China are very different. Um, the other thing that's important over there is um, the efforts to shut down and start new production, both of stainless and, and, and of mine molybdenum, um, has had very mixed success. Um, the, the stainless industry in China started off um, around about the 2002 mark. Um, when China was producing less than um, half a million tons. It's now around the 10 million, 10 to 15 million ton mark, um, depending on the year. And really that extra capacity has been capacity that's been brought on stream very quickly um, with variable regard to quality uh, and with, an, with, with a clear um, message to, to send that production to the domestic consumer. Now, as soon as these producers have tried to um, compete on the export market, they found it very difficult. And um, with a couple of notable exceptions, um, the bigger producers like uh, Tisco and Anshan and uh, Barsteel, they've been pretty unsuccessful on the international um, trading markets. And, and this, this will affect molybdenum consumption. But I think there's, there's a major case to be made for the performance factor mitigating the uh, the, the slowdown in, in volumes going forward. There is certainly a slowdown going forward in uh, stainless production and alloy production in, in Western Europe and North America, as well as Japan. And it's true that China will compensate for this, but the question is, at what intensity of use? Will their stainless steels have the same percentage of molybdenum on average as the current European stainless steels? At the moment, they certainly don't. But going forward, the molybdenum is a performance metal and um, certainly the environments where molybdenum applications operate um, require that performance. Um, I've given an example here of, of various um, oil and gas related applications where moly is, is, is essential. Uh, firstly in the drilling and extracting equipment um, through to transporting um, pipelines and tankers facing um, more and more extreme um, environments um, where light weighting is required but also high strength and resistance to corrosion and through to the refineries where molybdenum is required as a catalyst to uh, desulfurize the, uh, the oil uh, and the diesel and obviously as diesel becomes more and more attractive going forward um, this will have an impact on moly consumption in hydrocracking catalysts. Oil is obviously more sour and more remote um, there is a, an increased need for uh, high-performance tools, vessels, 
and chemicals for refining it. And all of this will reflect over time in a higher intensity of molybdenum use. The other um, major advantage that molybdenum has is that it's stopped being such a minor industry um, by comparison with some of its, um, some of its competitor, competitor materials. Um, I've given the example here of um, ferroniobium and ferrotungsten, which are two of the, the, the major competing materials. Um, both of them have their problems. Um, niobium is um, at continuous risk from monopolistic tendencies and the, the, the pricing implications that come with that. Um, there is one major producer in Brazil um, and though it has been used with success in some grades of stainless steel, overall its performance isn't as good as molybdenum in terms of corrosion protection and also hard, hardness um, at a low weight. Um, tungsten has been uh, very popular recently um, for anyone mining it. Um, prices have, uh, as you can see from that graph, prices have risen considerably and the availability has, uh, has dropped um, pretty much uh, alongside Chinese uh, trading restrictions. And though it operates as a good substitute for molybdenum in high speed and tall steels, um, there is a trade-off there because tungsten is considerably heavier. Um, there is a risk of um, taxation regulations being Im implemented, introduced and implemented um, pretty much, um, well, I wouldn't say random, but certainly without any correlation to the world market um, within China. And there is a short supply at present. And I think most of the consumers who use tungsten at, at present would say that they're biggest problem is not so much the, 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 the um, very high cost of the material, but it's actually sourcing physical material that is readily available for them. Um, and we've certainly had inquiries from a number of consumers of tungsten over the past um, to look into both substitution and alternative sources um, of material. So these are two possible substitutes that have some problems associated with them that don't exist in Mali. Mali is universally available. Um, it can be sourced from a variety of mines worldwide. The supply is well broken up into various, uh, various types of producers as well as, well as uh, a number of companies. And so that problem doesn't exist. And this will protect um, intensity of use in molybdenum. Now turning to the supply side, um, this is a slide that um, we put together in 2009 looking at various copper projects. Um, Back then, I think the price was somewhere around $3,000 a tonne when we made this slide. We looked at 62 major projects um, with substantial outputs of copper, and we decided that um, really there was a substantial degree of risk going forward for the industry, and that most <coughs> projects would need about $3,500 a tonne to succeed. Now, we've updated this slide a number of times since then, but this has remained the most relevant one um, given the current state of the market. I think less than half of these projects were projected to succeed back in 2009 and right now if we look at the, at the, at the market I, I think we'd say that pretty much all of them should be in production as soon as possible. Um, some of these have molybdenum um, credits, some do not. For the ones that do, our rule of thumb is that you need a, a, a contained resource of at least 200,000 tons of, of uh, molybdenum grading at about 0.02% um, in order to, sorry, 200,000 pounds, tons, tons, sorry, um, grading at about 0.02% um, molybdenum as a byproduct producer um, to make it worthwhile, worth your while installing a recovery circuit for Molly. <coughs> so this is, this is worth bearing in mind because the, the picture for supply looks a lot, di a, very different to how it looked about two years ago. The thing about copper though is that right now everyone's scrambling to get the units out of the ground and this is a, a two-sided coin for molly supply. It does mean that a lot more projects are in play than, than was the case not long ago and a lot of these have molly byproduct credits and therefore a lot more byproduct supply is available um, as these projects get developed. The flip side to that is that most of these um, producers that once relied on those molybdenum revenues um, to demonstrate the financial viability of their project are now focused on one single thing and that's getting <laughs> copper units out of the ground and 
making the copper recovery process work as smoothly and as efficiently as possible. Um, there is also an issue, and, and I heard several opinions in this direction at the, at the Santiago Copper Conference in April, that there, there generally isn't the human resource available to most companies um, in order for them to, to, to concentrate on both a, a copper recovery circuit and a moly recovery circuit. And when you have that human resource problem, it's likely that as a copper miner, your first and foremost priority is, is to get the copper recovery circuit working and working well. And certainly the, the, the miners that we have spoken to in the last year have said that this is the case, and therefore they will only install a molybdenum circuit once they have the copper circuit up and running and running well. Um, and this means a, a delay to, of up to two years um, from the startup of production between the copper recovery circuit working well and the moly recovery circuit being installed. So this works both ways for moly supply. There's more availability of it, but it could be delayed. In terms of supply discipline, um, and we, we talk about discipline in terms of respond, responding to uh, movements in the price and, and shoring up the market. Um, our opinion is that this, this discipline has improved considerably over the last few years. I mean, in 2005, when molybdenum prices went high and stayed high, it certainly was the case that byproduct producers tried to maximize their molly output. Um, some of them compromised quite a few years of mine. Uh, of, of, of mine planning to do so. Um, but certainly there wasn't a sense that the industry was making a concerted effort to keep prices at a certain level. By comparison, um, there are two factors that are helping producer discipline right now. One of them is that byproduct producers have uh, drip fed uh, molly units back onto the market as they've come back into production following cutbacks in 2009, and this is um, this is attenuated to a certain extent the effect of uh, of new supply of, of idle supply coming back to the market. The second thing has been the minor Chinese marginal producers. Um, these are small Chinese mines, mostly underground in the northeast of China, um, operating at under five million pounds a year. Um, some of them are family run. Most of them are not particularly well run and therefore they're at, at the marginal threshold, but they have been very disciplined in the way that they have stopped and started production um, depending on the price. So as soon as the price hits $16.5 a pound, they seem to come into production. As soon as the price goes back down below 15, they stop production. And they're able to do this um, with, with a quickness of response that, that wouldn't be available to Western producers. Um, there's a number of things that contribute to that the low cost of labor, the fact that um, mining is very labor intensive, the subsidies they receive from provincial governments, but all of this is contributing to them being very disciplined in the face of price movements in the market. So let's have a look at a, at a conceptual cost curve of, of molybdenum supply. Um, and it's a very stepped cost curve, that's, and, and generally the ranges are given by which category of producer you belong to. Um, the byproduct producers are, by, at the moment, the largest providers of molybdenum. Um, going forward, as a result of the copper boom, what's likely is that more operations will come on stream and provide more moly units. Um, because of the higher copper um, price plateau, it is the case that some of the uh, producers that didn't consider putting a moly circuit in um, some of the current copper producers that didn't consider pulling, putting a moly circuit in might consider it now, and also that a number of the new um, the new projects will bring with them um, moly supply, even at a higher cost. Um, so that's going to add to uh, supply. The large Chinese primaries, and I refer here to the large open pit miners, um, China Molybdenum, um, Jindu Chang, and, and also um, Chaoyang Jinda, these are producers that make more than 10 million pounds of contained molybdenum annually. Um, they'll continue to go strong, but um, their reserves are dwindling and there are cost inflation implications down the line. Um, this is going forward five or 10 years when that, when that cost base reaches a level that's comparable to, um, to similar Western operations. Um, and so there, there is a chance that production from, from 
those mines will decrease as, as reserves drop and as costs increase. The most interesting and important to me is, is, is the next category, which is the Western primaries and, and co-product mines. Um, the projects that are out there right now have been um, very selectively um, um, put to the test by the, by the credit crunch. So that from the, from the myriad of, of projects that we saw in early 2008, only a few of them have, have remained in business. Um, a couple of them, like, are like Adenac in, in Canada, have, have gone into bankruptcy and out again and are developing the projects again. But I think it is the case that most of the product, projects that are out there are pretty um, high scale. And as a result, their, their impact on the, on the market is considerably higher. The other thing that's happening is that a couple of these are, are lower cost than the existing producers. Uh, certainly the discovery of Merlin was a very exciting um, development for the industry. Um, this is a project in Australia by Ivanhoe uh, with an average grade of somewhere in the region of 1 to 1.5%, one which is unheard of in, in um, 21st century molybdenum mining. Um, and the rest of them are very large scale, um, low grade deposits that will probably operate towards the third and fourth quartile of the cost curve and will have, therefore have a, a serious impact on, on, the, cost, on the cost base um, and on the, on the floor for the price going forward. Um, what they'll also do is put considerable competitive pressure on the Chinese producers that I talked about, the small underground Chinese producers whose reserves are dwindling as well. Um, they've got very limited uh, support from the state and therefore um, they might find the competitive pressure from new suppliers uh, a bit too much to bear. And what's probably going to happen is that as cost inflation hits them harder um, and harder, they will find it a lot more difficult to compete with the Western primary sources of supply. So we expect that they'll gradually be, be um, taken out of the equation. Um, and that's, uh, you know, that's, that's one of those developments that you look at um, as, again, a two-sided coin. Um, these are producers that are certainly very difficult to predict in terms of behavior at the moment. It's very difficult to know um, exactly what they are doing. The, the operations are very small scale. But they are providing a certain buffer level to the market and their discipline to date seems to indicate that um, they would be able to do so going forward. The question is whether the primary producers that will take their place will be able to do the same thing. Bearing in mind these are junior operations um, owned by junior companies who depend on those, on those revenues and those cash flows. Um, so the question is if, if the price does, does head south for a period as the, uh, as the stainless and alloy steel demand drops following its usual patterns of cyclicality. You know, will, will these primary producers be able to adapt production in the same way that the Chinese marginals are doing at the moment? It's a, it's a good question to ask. So these are some things to look out for and some questions worth asking and I think some useful indicators looking at the next decade. Um, firstly, in the short term, the uh, autumn revival, we need, to, we need to look out for it, um, and as soon as it comes, I, I expect it will happen pretty, pretty steeply, but um, very few signs of it so far. Um, how ample will the nickel cycles be going forward? And this, I've put it down as a short-term development, but really it's a short, medium and long-term development. Um, if nickel laterites end up being a viable source of nickel units going forward, it's likely that that cycle will, uh, will be less ample. Um, and that would help the molybdenum industry. And then we have to look at the Chinese stainless production restarts. Um, quite a lot of capa stainless capacity in China was idled during 2009 and early 2010. Some of that has come back to the market, but there, there, there are suspicions that quite, quite a substantial chunk of that um, stainless capacity is idled permanently. Um, it's likely that the operations that have been idled um, are the ones making bog standard 200 series and 304 stainless steel, in which case the molly um, industry will not be affected. But if any of the 300, 316 or 445 producers are affected, then that could affect molly demand in China. In the medium term, the issue is how, how well with com will competing materials fare 
in the world markets. Will the competing materials also come out of this minor metal cone of obscurity and provide more transparent markets where it's easier to trade in them and make them more available to the consumers? And also, is that Chinese capacity, that Chinese marginal capacity that we talked about, is it being wiped out as Western primaries come on stream? Or are they doggedly continuing to produce molly? If they do, there could be oversupply. If they drop out very quickly, there could be a period of deficit. And also, are new byproduct producers seeking to commission the molly circuit early and timing their entry carefully? Um, so far, I'm pretty optimistic that they will continue to have this discipline that they've been having in terms of timing their entry onto the market. But remember, their primary objective is, um, is, is copper, and they will, their output will depend greatly on, on their output in copper. Um, and so how that affects the molly industry will, will remain to be seen. Over the long term, the oil and gas prices and, and the, the, the success of, the, of light weighting as, as an effort will, uh, will impact intensity of use in a very positive way, we think. And environmental regulations will also help boost molybdenum demand um, as a catalyst and as, a, as, a, as an agent of enhanced performance. There are very few substitutes to Molly, and so that's that's positive going forward. The question is, how how far forward is that future? And finally, are there enough small primary producers to keep primary production flexible at the top of that cost curve, or is it the case that any changes in production occur in very big chunks that affect the industry price levels and and cause increased volatility? So these are some of the things I think we need to look at over the next ten years. Um, I don't have many answers to all of these and very few of those are definite but um, you know if if, uh, if you want to talk about them I'm, I'm, uh, I'm happy to answer the most best I can thank you thank you very much uh, are there any questions from the floor I have one very very quick question with the uh, cob price tumbling uh, as it has done over the last uh, few weeks is there now a prospect for uh, co-production of molybdenum uh, to fall in line? Um, good question, and I, I dare say it's not the first time I've been asked it this week. Um, firstly, a bit of context: the, the copper price has been tumbling to about seven thousand dollars a ton. We, when we forecast long long run marginal price in copper, we think about four thousand, four and a half thousand. So, I think we're still at a level where copper producers are pretty happy. And, and they will continue to accelerate the, the development of their projects to get, you know, to get them, the copper out of the ground while they're going is good. Um, so I don't think that's going to affect the picture decisively. I think if, if copper dropped below six or maybe below five thousand dollars a ton, then that would that would be possible. But I don't see that happening. Um, so so yeah, I think I think for the time being, it's uh, it's as you were in in the byproduct. Uh, sector. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, please. Are there any cases where um, molybdenum is reprocessed from tailings where they haven't previously installed the molly circuit? In um, I've heard of two instances in Australia where people have tried to do it. Um, one of them was, um, and this is going back about two years, I think, to the um, to when I went to um, diggers and dealers in Australia, and there was one company that was exploiting tailings from a mine that was shut down in the 1920s. Um, and the mine was, um, was operating with grades of about 13%, so the tailings were grading about 0.8 to 1%, which would make it a very high grade mine. But I think there's, uh, there's some issues around permitting, and I haven't seen many instances of that outside Australia. Um, and those producers in Australia certainly aren't operating on high tonnages, they're, they're small operations. Any other questions? Yes, please. You mentioned in the course of your speech, or rather the closing, the closing remarks, that the uh, uh, would benefit from tougher environmental regulations. You must be the only uh, part of the mining sector to welcome the likes of tree picks. Would you care to comment? Um, yes, I would, actually. Um, <laughs> Going to when, when I went to Pittsburgh last week, um, there was a lot of uproar in the in the molybdenum world, and please understand it's quite a small world. Um, 
about the fact that the uh, U.S. government had put some regulations stating that um, quite a lot of the food packing business uh, was not allowed to have molly bearing braids in it because molybdenum as a heavy metal is a little bit toxic. Um, and there was some uproar concerning this, but overall environmental regulations are very good for molly. Um, certainly, um, and I have a graph on this but not with me right now, um, the the increase from Euro 3 to Euro 4 to 5 and Euro 6 regulations in terms of the allowance of, of sulfur in, uh, in diesel, for example, is a very good example where as the regulations state that there needs to be less and less sulfur in the diesel, um, the hydro cracking of the diesel to remove the sulfur requires more and more molybdenum. And that's an area where I think we're, we're very bullish on, on the prospects for molybdenum consumption in, in, um, in catalysts. The other area is um, concerning environmental regulations is to what extent do you have to refine um, and, and, and in what conditions do you have to transport and also drill for oil in increasingly remote locations. You know, I, I, it's, I think the BP disaster showed that there's going to be tougher and tougher regulations on, um, on drilling and, and also on, on, the, on the transport of oil around the world. And, all of that means that hulls are going to have to have stronger steel um, and at the same time lighter steel and, and so that's very good news for Molly. So I think, yeah, I, I agree with you, it's one of the few industries in the world that looks forward to environmental regulations. Um, although I know a number of producers that have found it difficult to advance their projects as a result of environmental permitting issues, so again it's a two-sided coin. Um, one example of that is Climax obviously who have a wonderful deposit um, in the middle of of, of lobby country in, in Colorado, and two slopes across from Aspen. Um, so I don't th I don't think they're big fans of environmental regulations, but uh, different different regulations. Okay, uh, if there are no other questions, uh, Annette, we'd like to thank you again once. Thank you.